Hi, I'm Michael Woods, Chief Scientist at the Asian Turfgrass Center. Welcome to another ATC Double Cut, where I talk about a topic that I've written about on the ATC blog. And today, the topic is the results of a survey that I did about soil sampling procedures. Now, that sounds like a pretty dry topic, and I've I've thought it a dry topic myself for many, many years. And it's it's something that I haven't paid so much attention to because I was more interested in the laboratory procedures and in the interpretation of the test results. More recently, however, I have been interested in how people collect samples and I've been trying to optimize that a little bit and see how different ways of collecting the samples might have an effect on the laboratory procedures or especially on the interpretation. And I'm going to refer real quick to the um, Turfgrass Soil Fertility and Chemical Problems book, which is the, the textbook basically about turfgrass soil fertility. And if I look on page 160 on the soil testing uh, section, the, the section on assessing chemical and nutrient status, and in the sampling section, it begins with this quote. It says, sampling is considered by many to be the greatest source of error in soil testing programs. Uh, that that is pretty important. If, if that's the greatest source of error, then we probably want to get that right. And they recommend how, how they recommend taking samples for any area. And by area, we would be talking about something like a lawn or about a single putting green or a single tee or a single, um, a single area, a single zone of, of turf grass that will be managed in the same way. We're talking about a zone that will be fertilized in the same way. So it, it might be a lawn, it might be a green, a single green, it might be a single tea, something like that. For that type of area, they recommend taking a representative sample. They recommend taking at least 20 subsamples from that area. And let's just jump right into the survey and the post. I can refer to what uh, doctors Carol Waddington and Riki wrote about in in that section of the book, which I've just reviewed today. Um, I can I can refer to that as we go through the results about how you answered this survey. So I started off on my blog. Uh, I did a, a post about how do you collect and prepare soil samples, and I put a link in that to a survey. And if I go through to well, that I'll talk about this just a little bit. This is based on kind of a follow-up of some questions that I've been asking. I asked a survey on Twitter in uh, 2020, I believe. Yeah, it was it was at the start of 2020, uh, and I asked if people are taking composite samples or not, if they're following the recommendations, where the standard recommendation from a couple of universities in the U.S., if I remember right, Penn State and Rutgers have in, have um, instructions on their website that you should take a minimum of, tw of 12 subsamples from each area. And I don't take that many. I've, I've been taking about five subsamples per area for convenience and feeling that that's pretty good. I, it, I, I feel that that gives me a representative sample, but I recognize that that's not following the standard recommendation. So I've been interested in this because I wanted to make sure I wasn't making a mistake. And I've been doing some research on this over the past couple of years to try to check the variability from subsample to subsample and simulate some fertilizer recommendations based on different sampling procedures. So how this survey came about, uh, I, I'd done that survey on Twitter a couple of years ago. Then I did a quick one on Instagram and I asked, do for routine soil tests, do you follow the standard recommendation of 12 or more subsamples from each area? And the people who viewed my Instagram story and answered that, 44% yes, said yes, 56% said no. 
So that let's say that's about a 50-50 response in terms of half the people are taking the recommended number of subsamples and half are not. And I thought that's interesting. I would like to assess this and a few other questions further. So I prepared a quick survey and I sent that out in a blog post. And I did that, oh, about a week ago. And then I, I said, I will share the results. So I had 79 responses to this complete survey. The complete survey had seven questions, but it was set up. So uh, if, if you answered no to a particular question, sometimes you didn't have to answer the follow-up question. So the, the full number of questions was seven. A few people, um, I think five people answered no to the first question, so they skipped directly to question number four. So he, he, here's the results of the survey. I, I think you will find this interesting, and it shows that there are some opportunities to standardize things a little bit more and possibly make even better or more accurate or more consistent sampling procedures that will lead to even in, uh, what would it lead to? Improved nutrient management of of turf grass sites. First question was that same one that I'd asked in 2020, and I'd asked it again in my Instagram story. It was, do you take a composite sample? The exact wording of this was, do you collect subsamples and combine or composite them into a larger representative sample for the area being sampled? By area, again, we're talking about a single green or a single tee or a single lawn or a single fairway. Do you take subsamples from that or not? 93.7% responded yes. That's the standard way. A daring 6.3% responded no. And that may be some of the people who have been listening to some of my advice over the past couple of years where I've suggested that it may not be necessary to take composite samples. Um, that is is something that I hope to write more about and talk more about in the future. So that's good. Uh, most people are doing it the standard way, but let, let, let's go into that in a little bit more. So the follow-up question to that was how many subsamples do you collect per area? And the majority, or let's see, the what's what's the word? The the highest ranking answer was from 12 to 20. 44.6% of the respondents take from 12 to 20 subsamples per area. And keep in mind that's the rec that's the standard recommendation. The recommendation that I found from Penn State University and I believe from Rutgers was to take at least 12 subsamples from each area being tested. As I've just reviewed the Turfgrass Soil Fertility and Chemical Problems book, I see that they recommend 20 subsamples per area. So we're in the we're in the ballpark almost half of the respondents are collecting according to the recommendations. But it's interesting uh, it's it's not quite up to 50%. It's 44.6% are collecting that many subsamples. The next highest number of respondents are taking from 6 to 11. This is 43.2%. 43.2% of the respondents to the survey are taking from 6 to 11 subsamples per area. So they're taking, they're definitely taking subsamples. They're taking more than I typically have, which is five but they're taking less than the recommended amount. A very hardworking 8.1% of respondents are taking more than 20. And I'm pretty sure that if you're taking more than 20 subsamples per area, you are certainly getting what could be considered a representative sample. And then two to, uh, two to five was the other option and 4.1% of the respondents, less than, well, about half of, half of the number that are taking more than 20 are, 
taking only two to five subsamples per area. So, um, what was it? 90, 93.7. We'll round that up to 94%. 94% of the people responding are taking a composite sample, but then it really breaks down quite a bit um, into a lot of variability where um, about 52% are taking from 12 to more than 20, and then about 48% are taking from uh, 2 up to 11. So that's interesting. So if, if we are trying to take representative samples, it it seems like it would be good to know exactly how many are taken. Uh, no, how many are required in order to get a representative sample. It turns out there's not a tremendous amount of research about this. So the uh, in turf grass, the recommendation to take 12 or more, 15 or more, 20 or more subsamples is not based on a huge amount of research in turf grass. So I think there is some opportunity to refine that a little bit. I want to talk a little bit about who answered the survey. And I don't know, but we we can consider that the people who answered the survey are people who subscribe to my blog by email or who read my blog or who follow me on Twitter. And they're probably people who are interested in answering surveys, interested in doing me a favor by helping me out in answering this, and probably people who are interested in soil testing and trying to do it in the most careful way. I would think. So I, I really don't know how to get a random sample of respondents from the turf grass industry, but th this, this type of response that, that we did get must have some bias to it. And the bias is probably towards people who do do soil testing and who are kind of interested in this topic. So if we think about that, um, if we think this is what the people who are really interested in this, willing to spend their time to take a survey that that takes a couple minutes to answer these type of questions about the sampling procedures involved with turf grass soil testing, if we think that this group of people is sampling in quite a varied way, as as these results in question two show about how many subsamples are collected per area. And then if we if we think that it's already varied among these people who are quite into soil testing, I would expect that for the general public and for turf grass managers who are less into the details of soil testing, the turf grass managers who don't follow what I'm talking about in this ATC Double Cup podcast or who don't follow my blog or listen to my seminars or or see some of my seminars, um, they, they probably are doing this in even more varied ways, I would expect. So there's probably even more variation than what we see in this survey. Now, question three, moving on to question three, do you take a subsample out of the composite? Because once you've taken all those subsamples and mixed them together, the standard recommendation is to take a subsample out of the composite, and the volume of the subsample should be in the amount that the laboratory has given you instructions of how much material they require. So this, the standard here, the expectation with the instructions, is not that you're going to send all of the material that you've collected, but that you've collected all those subsamples in order to combine them together into a composite sample. And then you are supposed to collect your own representative sample out of those mixed together subsamples and send that to the lab as the sample. Well, it turns out only 14.9, I'm just gonna round these so we don't have to deal with decimal points. Uh, only 15% of the respondents to this survey are doing that. Only 15% are following those instructions. 85% are sending all the material. Now, I, I actually don't think that's too bad because at the laboratory, they will 
do some procedures that will mix the soil and they will take a representative sample. So the only thing that you're really doing is sending more material to the lab than is necessary and increasing the shipping cost. Um, but as far as accuracy, I don't think you're really losing anything by sending the whole sample to the lab. But it's interesting that uh, for question number one, as far as people taking a composite sample or not, almost everybody is taking a composite sample. But then when we say, do you take a subsample out of the composite, like the instructions say, uh, only 15% are, follow, are following the instructions to that degree. Then we move on to something else, question number four, which is, do you cut off or pinch off the top of the sample containing grass or thatch mat material before sending to the lab? And this was divided almost evenly. 54% leave that material on the sample. They leave the grass and the thatch and they send it all to the lab together with the soil. But 46% remove the top of the sample. So that's interesting because we have, if, if we say, let's just say that's 50% and 50%, that's half the people doing it one way, half the people doing it another way. I don't think it matters too much in reality because what happens at the laboratory is the sample gets dried it gets ground or crushed, so it will pass a two, millimeter, a two millimeter sieve, and all of the plant material and the thatch material gets removed from the sample anyway at the lab. It's done by a automated process, or people are operating those machines, but the machines and the screen do this in a systematic way. I used to remove this material myself. I used to take off the plant material right at the top of the sample, the very top layer of thatch. I used to take that off and discard it and send in the remaining material. I don't recommend doing that anymore because I realized it's a bit inconsistent to do it myself. And I would rather allow the machinery at the laboratory to handle that for me because I think the machinery at the laboratory will do that in a more consistent way than I can. Again, for this question four about removing that material or not, it doesn't really matter probably for the results because if you do remove it, that's fine. The sample at the laboratory will get tested normally. And if you don't remove it, that extra material, the grass material, the thatch material, it will get removed at the laboratory anyway. So you probably end up with a similar result, whether you remove it yourself or whether you leave it up to the lab to remove it. My preference at this time is to let the lab remove it because I think it's more consistent. It's likely to be more consistent. Question number five was how deep do you collect soil samples? And this one is kind of all over the place too, although there was a strong preference for four inches or 10 centimeters. 59% uh, of the respondents answered with that. And 17.9%, you know, I'm, I'm going to go back to rounding, <laughs> uh, the three inch depth or seven and a half centimeters, that was 18% of the respondents. That was number two. And I will say that this is this is within the recommendation of the Turfgrass Soil Fertility and Chemical Problems book by Drs. Carol, Ricky, and Waddington. They recommend for turf grass to take samples that is anywhere in the range from two inches to four inches. So the, the shallowest that they recommend is two inches or five centimeters. The deepest that they recommend taking would be 10 centimeters or four inches. And the important thing that they stress is taking the sample at the consistent depth over time. Uh, so if, you, if you've sampled at 10 centimeters this year, they recommend sampling at 10 centimeters next year and continuing to sample very carefully at 10 centimeters. 
and they recommend whatever depth you choose, whether it's two inches, three inches, or four inches, which would be five centimeters, 7.5 centimeters, or 10 centimeters, they recommend picking a depth and sticking with it. That's what I would recommend too. And I find for most turf grass situations, I like to use a depth of 10 centimeters, but I agree with them that uh, it, it, it's likely that you'd want to go about 10 centimeters, maybe seven and a half centimeters. I, I rarely work with turf that has roots that are only two centimeters, uh, sorry, five centimeters, two inches deep. So it, it doesn't make a huge amount of sense to me to shallow only that short if we have roots that are deeper than that. But, uh, apparently some poa annua roots are are shallow like that so you can decide that for your own site and the only places where i really see roots that are very deep is fine fescue um, brand new greens and some warm season turf or fairway turf even so the most of the nutrient uptake water uptake biological activity a lot of that's happening in the top 10 centimeters. So even when the roots do go down deeper, I'm usually pretty comfortable having a max depth of, of 10 centimeters. 13% are taking samples down to 15 centimeters or six inches. That's deeper than is recommended in this book. Um, it's deeper than I recommend. And, um, yeah, that, that's what's pretty standard for agriculture. Uh, for turf grass, I think something about 10 centimeters or less is, works good. 9% say it varies by root or mat depth. I hope that's not varying over time because if you vary the sample depth over time, it's impossible to interpret the results. Um, one person responded deeper than six inches. They're going deeper than six inches, which... Yeah, if you have like crazy deep fescue roots or something, maybe maybe you can do that. But special special cases. I think the standard way I was I was glad that 59% of the people responded with 10 centimeters and I would encourage people to measure at the same depth over time. This is something that you'd want to consider for your soil sampling plan. We're getting to the end of the questions question number six out of seven question number six was when do you sample in which season of the year do you prefer to collect samples 38 percent are doing multiple times per year 23 percent the next the next most uh answered season was spring 23 percent 22 percent are doing in autumn 15 percent in winter three percent in summer I like autumn in temperate regions because that's when the nutrient levels tend to be the lowest. Larry Stoll from Pace Turf put a survey out, and you can see that in the Pace Turf member edition uh, recently, or check the survey results. I think you can find it at the Pace Turf Twitter account. And the the results there were also, I think, multiple times per year and then spring. That was number one. I've had a conversation with Dr. Stoll after this because as I was thinking about it, I was like, why am I recommending autumn? But the number one answer seems to be something different. And I realized that it's not so much autumn that I'm recommending because I recommend it different times in tropical regions where there's a rainy season and then a dry season. And I recommend doing it differently if you have a salinity issue too. And I realized that what I really want to recommend is collect the soil samples. If you're collecting soil samples for the purpose of making fertilizer recommendations, collect the soil samples at the time of year when you have the expectation that soil nutrient levels will be at their lowest. And it turns out that in temperate regions that are not over fertilized, and by that I mean they are supplied with what I would consider a reasonable amount of nutrient supply. What you'll find is at the end of the growing season, the nutrient levels in the soil will tend to be the lowest. And 
I also like autumn because it gives some time for planning for the next year's fertilizer program. It gives you the entire winter to plan that and to get prepared. Of course, multiple times per year works good too. Uh, but if you're going to only do it once, I try to do it at the time of the year at your location where you expect the soil nutrient levels to be the lowest. If it's a salt affected site, then that's going to be at the end of the time of the year um, when you've had a rainy season and some of the salts have leached. If you're in the part of the world where you don't have a rainy season and you're irrigating with saline irrigation water, then I would be testing continuously. So it just sort of depends on what type of irrigation water you have and what type of climate you're in. But, but for me, it makes sense to try to figure out, try to figure out where in the year, where in the calendar your soil nutrient levels are likely to be the lowest. That gives a good answer to the when do you sample question. And number seven, which has led to a bit of discussion on the ATC Turf Discord server, uh, question seven, the final one, do you dry the soil samples before sending them to the lab? 79% do not dry the samples, 22% do dry the samples. And I dry the samples because once you take the soil out of, once you take the sample out of the soil, it's now in a wet condition because it's at whatever moisture content it was as it was pulled out of the soil. It's now at a uncontrolled temperature, at least once you start shipping it, it's going to be at an uncontrolled temperature and it's exposed to a lot of air. So a number of conditions have changed since it was in the soil. The sample is going to be dried when it arrives to the lab. And I like to dry it immediately. I like to start that drying process immediately so that as the sample makes its way to the lab, it's dried already because that will stop biological activity. It will stop chemical reactions. When soils are stored, if you look, for example, at the samples from the park grass experiment, they, they have soil samples from the park grass experiment, I think from 1856, certainly from like 1858, 1861, you can still see some of these bottles at the Rothamsted Research Area, the, Roth the Rothamsted Research Center in England. And those samples are dried. The soil samples are dried. And that essentially is the long-term preservation of soil samples. The standard way to do it is just dry and store them at room temperature. So what I like to do, instead of letting the sample go to the laboratory in a undetermined shipping time, of, of course, I'm, I'm often shipping to Brookside Labs in the United States, and my clients are also, we're shipping uh, many of us from outside of the US. So the shipping time might be three days, it might be five days. More recently, it's been 10 days to two weeks. And we don't know what the temperatures will be as that sample makes its way to the laboratory. And if we have it in a sealed bag, which it needs to be if you're shipping samples internationally, then the moisture content is not going to change in the sample. So if we have high temperatures and relatively high moisture, there can be all kinds of biological activity, all kinds of chemical reactions that could be occurring in the sample in the time between it was between the time it was collected from the soil and the time that it starts the drying process at the laboratory. If you're shipping samples from your location to a local laboratory and it's going to be getting there very rapidly, then maybe it makes sense to just leave it in the field wet condition. For me, I'm trying to minimize any uncertainty about what might have happened with the sample as it's made its way to the laboratory. So I make it a matter of practice to dry the samples prior 
to shipping them to the lab. An additional benefit of this is it reduces the shipping cost. And one of the things that I am concerned about when I'm doing international uh, soil sample shipping is how much it costs. So uh, I'm able to save a little bit of money by drying the samples. That is the answers to that survey. And I think it is fascinating to find how much variability there is in the way people are doing these, uh, doing the sample collection. And I think from the results of that survey, there's nothing that really stands out as likely to be causing a big error in the results. The one thing that would cause a big error, error in the results would be collecting samples at different depths over time. So if, if you're not careful about the depth and you collect it four inches this year and three inches next year, you would expect the results to change. They, they almost certainly will change. Perhaps they would change by an appreciable amount. And that amount would not be because of the way the grass grew and used nutrients and the fertilizer that was applied the change would be simply because of the way that the sample was collected. So the most important thing I think here is sample depth and then taking samples consistently at the same time of year. And of course, you want to consider the laboratory procedures that are done, but that's kind of uh, another topic. So uh, it's interesting. This is something that I've been researching a bit and i've got a few ongoing research projects about this i've hinted at some of these on my blog so if you're a regular reader of the blog you know about some of these about looking at uh, whether you should take a composite sample or whether you take a single core sample if you've listened to this all the way up to this point then you might actually be interested in this topic and I'll elaborate on it just a little bit. So the the problem that we have with taking a composite sample, uh, which is meant to give a representative assessment of the area, and it's what's recommended right here in the Turfgrass Soil Fertility and Chemical Problems book, uh, they stress that by taking 20 subsamples from an area, and in, in this book they are recommending 20. They say that by taking 20 subsamples from an area, by compositing them together, you are almost certain to get what they call a representative sample. But the assumption behind this is that as nutrient content varies throughout the soil from one point to the next, the assumption is that it's, it's normally distributed which would mean that you'd have a symmetric distribution where the average would be in the middle and you'd have an equal number of samples to the high side and you'd have an equal number of samples to the low side of the average. However, it's unlikely that soil nutrients are actually normally distributed because there is a hard bound at the bottom. They can't go negative. The soil nutrients essentially are bounded at the bottom by they, they can only be as low as zero. They can't be any lower than zero, but on the upper end, it's unrestricted. There's no bound. So you, you could conceivably have very high levels of potassium or phosphorus or other elements. Because of that, if you assume that the subsamples that you've collected as you're making that representative sample is you're taking all those subsamples and mixing them together. The effect, if you work through the math, should be a systematic overestimation of the nutrient content. And that is a bit of a problem because we're trying to find the low areas. We're trying to find any areas that might be too low in a nutrient so that we can make sure that we apply enough as fertilizer. That's that's kind of the underlying thing that I'm trying to figure out. And 
that's something that I hope to have uh, a few reports to share with you later this year, which of course they will be written about on the ATC website and I will share them in the ATC Double Cut. Thank you for listening. For ATC in Yantakau, I'm Micah Woods.